Hi. Welcome to Drinking the Kool-Aid. Welcome. I'm Megan. I'm Hannah. And we are starting the case of Jonathan Luna. You always say it like I'm supposed to know, like the way you say it. It's no. like the case of, and I'm like, God, I never know names. No, no, no. You don't know this one. Okay, cool. I can I, guarantee it. I like the Luna part, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there is no possible way that I can condense this. So okay. we're going to definitely be looking at like a five-parter. Oh, wow. For okay. This one. Okay. Um, and Ooh, we're getting into detail. I love these ones. Oh, yeah. There's a lot happening. And just so you are aware, too, right off the bat, um, most of the names in the story, you're going to notice that I just used first and last for, like, everybody constantly. And the reason for that is because there's actually so many people involved in this story that I didn't want it to get really confusing. Okay. So... I read The Midnight Ride of Jonathan Luna by William Kiesling. I listened to Crime Junkie. I listened to two episodes of True Crime Garage, which I love that podcast. And I also listened to Somebody Somewhere Season 3, which was an 11-episode series. Whoa. Yeah, so lots happening here. So if you want more on this case... Please go listen to those because they all did a great job. Okay. All right. So. There are many mysteries to unravel in this story. Was this suicide? Oh, no. You're laying another one of these on me? Yeah, I have to. Fuck! Mm -hmm. Why would Jonathan Luna's autopsy report be sealed and withheld from the public? Why did his co-workers work to destroy his reputation? This mystery is full of false leaks, misinformation, and straight-up lies. On the surface, it's a tragic death. But if you look close, you'll notice that there's a lot of strange and nefarious activities happening in the background, and someone just might be manipulating the case to throw everyone off the trail. Man, I can't believe you're hitting me with another one of these. I had to. It's, these ones really freaking piss me off. They will fuck you up. I'm telling you. I'm, yeah. So here we go again. Yes. <laughs> we have to. Oh, okay. I'm like mentally preparing myself to be annoyed. Here we go. One more time. <sighs> All right. That did help a little bit. Fine. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> See, you're bebopping to yeah. it. <laughs> like, did yes, a little yes, jam yes, over here. here. Go. That's exactly what was going through my brain. <laughs> Jonathan Luna was a complex person, according to his friend Dan Rivera. He said, quote, we thought he was a bit of an oddball. He had a ready sense of humor and an intellect that didn't always operate head on, but beneath the surface. He was larger than life, confident, funny, loyal, charismatic, and some of his friends called him Joey. Jonathan Paul Luna was born on October 21st of 1965, and he grew up in a public housing project called the Patterson Houses in what's called the Mott Haven section of the South Bronx, and it's located near Yankee Stadium. Wow. In the book, the author quoted an article from Scientific American that said, quote, The Mott Haven section of New York City's South Bronx has long been one of the poorest neighborhoods in the nation. The median household income of its residents, most of whom are African American or Hispanic, is less than one third of the U.S. median. Holy shit. Yeah. So Jonathan's father was Filipino, and his mother was black, and he himself identified more as black. He was very aware of racism early on, and he was different than the other kids that were growing up in the projects. He wanted to learn and read. He had a linen closet in his apartment that he actually turned into a library, which I think is really rad. 
and it was stuffed full of books and magazines. That is cool. And he felt like it just provided him with an escape from the streets. Yeah. Jonathan's father waited tables at neighborhood restaurants, and then his mother stayed home to raise the kids. There was violence and drugs happening all around the Patterson houses, and Jonathan would see people from his apartment window lining up to buy drugs from the street dealers. That's rough. Yeah. Jonathan grew up seeing exactly what drugs could do to people, and he was just determined that that was not going to be his life. He was going to steer clear. But it was tough to avoid the violence that was happening all around him. His close friend that grew up with him, Dan Rivera, said they were just trying to stay alive every day. The two of them were determined to escape. Jonathan threw himself into his studies, and he started running. He would always tell his friend Dan that they needed to stay active, keep their mind, bodies, and souls healthy. He wanted to be physically fit and well-educated. When Jonathan was in high school, he barely left his house to do anything, even with his friends, because he was spending so much time studying. They didn't know anybody who had graduated from college, but Jonathan was determined to be the first. He knew early on that if he wanted to be successful, he had to dress the part. In high school, he started wearing stylish clothing with ties and trench coats, and his friends dubbed him a fashionista. That's amazing. It is so cool. (laughs) He purchased GQ magazines and started studying fashion books. People were noticing the effort that he was putting in, and they were telling him that he looked like Michael Jackson from the Thriller album. Oh, hell yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. After junior high, Jonathan enrolled in the New York School of Printing, a public trade school. By his senior year in high school, he decided to study law. So he enrolled in New New York's Hunter College, then he transferred to Fordham University. After graduating with a history degree, he traveled to Germany. When he was 23 years old, he was accepted into the University of North Carolina School of Law. The majority of the people that were attending this school had a lot of money, at least more than he did. The kids in law school were driving BMWs, and Jonathan had a bicycle. He could have let this intimidate him or make him feel like he didn't fit in. It could have made him feel jealous. But instead, it made him work harder to prove that he deserved to be there. In a letter to a friend, he wrote, quote, What I try to keep in mind is that these people are just people, no more or less than myself. He told his friend, quote, You are young, bright, healthy, single, and the world is at your feet. You are in command, and you alone can determine your destiny. All we have to do is remind ourselves of people that we know who really don't have many avenues open to them. Your density. (laughs) What? (laughs) You said destiny, and my freaking mind only can go to, I'm your density. Please tell me you know what that's from. No, this one's escaping me. I'm so sorry. It's Back to the Future. Oh, of course. Okay. It's one of my favorite lines from that. Whoops. It's when he's got it written on his hand, so he thinks it thinks it says density. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why that escaped my brain hole. I don't know why it did either. Sorry about that. Usually I catch on to those. You must need to watch it soon. I must. That's a problem. Okay. Yeah, we're just going to have to do that maybe tonight. All right. Yep. Okay. So towards the end of his first year at the University of North Carolina, Jonathan found out that his dad had cancer. So he took a year off and he took care of him. He did go back to school, and yes, his father was fine. Okay. And well, it's like you knew what I was going to ask next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so when he got back into school, he met Angela Hopkins. Um, she was in her last year of medical school, and they got married on August 29th of 1993. 
In September, Jonathan was hired as an associate at Arnold & Porter, which is a prestigious Washington, D.C. law firm. From 1994 to 1997, he worked as staff attorney in the Federal Trade Commission's General Counsel's office. And then he realized that he was really drawn to prosecution because he wanted to help people who had been stuck in similar situations to him when he was growing up in the Patterson houses. Oh, that's really freaking cool. Right. In 1997, he got a job as an assistant district attorney in the Brooklyn DA's office. In 1999, he was hired as an assistant U.S. attorney in the Maryland U.S. attorney's office. So he moved his family back to Baltimore because he wanted his wife to be closer to her family. Okay. During his four years with the office, Jonathan prosecuted about 80 criminal cases and six civil cases. Everything was going great at first. When he was initially hired, former U.S. attorney Lynn Battaglia was his boss, and she said he was, quote, bright, engaging, enthusiastic, I just thought he'd be a really good prosecutor. Now, unfortunately, she was replaced in 2001. And I say unfortunately for Jonathan's sake here. So she was replaced by Thomas DiBaggio. And that's when Jonathan started to struggle. A former prosecutor, Andrew White, recalled that, quote, he and Jonathan did not see eye to eye. If you get on the wrong foot with Thomas DiBaggio, it's difficult to get back in good standing. Jonathan's friends say that he was kind-hearted and energetic. He was the type of person who often helped the less fortunate by providing them with legal aid, and he represented victims of hate crimes and racism in the court. His mother-in-law was living with them in their basement, and then he moved his own parents into an apartment just a few miles away, and then he was helping with their payments. That is so sweet. It is. It's just incredible because now his wife is closer to her family, and you know he has his mother-in-law in the basement. He moves his family closer. I mean, that's really cool. He also was driving his parents around town in his vehicle, so if they needed to go somewhere, he was taking care of that as well. He had a lot going on. And one thing to keep in mind, because this is going to become very clear later as to why it's important. Okay. As Jonathan aged, his eyesight got worse. So he had glasses, and yes, that means he needed them to drive. Okay. So okay. just okay. tuck that away in your brain for a while. Okay. I'll find a little fold to put it in. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it was December 4th, 2003, when Jonathan Luna's car was discovered a short distance from the road near some trees. It was idling in the dark, located just a few minutes from the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Blood and small amounts of money were strewn around the inside of the car. Jonathan's body was lying outside of the vehicle near the front bumper. He was face down in an icy stream and the water was running around him. His throat was slashed and he had stab wounds all over his body. On his right hand, he wore a law school ring that depicted the scales of justice. Jonathan Luna was a prosecutor and he was 38 years old. He was still dressed in his court attire with a Justice Department ID badge hanging around his neck. He was supposed to be in court later that morning for a case he was prosecuting. The case involved a hip-hop record producer and an associate who had been accused of selling large quantities of heroin in Baltimore. Just slightly before midnight, Jonathan had left his desk at the office and disappeared until his body was discovered later. He left several items in his office, including his cell phone, his glasses, and an unfinished plea agreement, which was typed up on his office laptop that was sitting on his desk. Okay, so like all things that he would have wanted slash needed. Correct. Everything you think you would take with you. Jonathan was an assistant U.S. attorney, so he was often involved in some really violent cases. 
Prior to his death, he had prosecuted three men who were selling cocaine in Baltimore. A man who planned to burn down a house to get rid of six people. A robber who shot up banks. A Navy physicist who was using the internet to find young girls. It was a lot of awful cases coming across his desk. And perhaps it put him in danger. Well, I feel like, honestly, when you're in that job, regardless, it can put you in danger. I think so, too. But to what degree? I'm just not sure. No, I'm not either. But like, I, I, I guess like any law job like that. Yeah. I just feel like no matter what, because if you accidentally like are representing the wrong person without realizing, you know, you have no idea what they can do. Absolutely. And even if somebody's locked up, they could order a hit. Right. You don't know. Jonathan did confide in his friends about his job and said that his boss, U.S. Attorney Thomas DiBaggio, thought that he wasn't doing a good job and was trying to push him out of there. So Jonathan was working harder and later at work. One coworker said that he overheard DiBaggio say Jonathan was gone. And another coworker told Jonathan that maybe he should get a lawyer to represent him with all his troubles with his boss. He did take this advice, and shortly before his death, he retained former federal prosecutor Andrew C. White. So he's having so much trouble with his boss that he felt the need to obtain a lawyer. Then he winds up dead right after. That is, a, I mean, that's a lot. You can see trouble. how this looks real bad. Yeah. Jonathan's friends started talking to the reporters, and word got out that he was worried about losing his job. And Thomas DiBaggio denied the claims. And he told the Baltimore Sun, quote, his job was not in jeopardy in any respect. Jonathan Luna is remembered by this office as being a wonderful colleague, and his death is a genuine loss to us all. Months later, in the summer of 2004, the real story came out. A former coworker, assistant U.S. attorney Lisa Griffin, wrote to Thomas DiBaggio saying that, quote, I am deeply embarrassed to hear that you led the press to believe that Jonathan was not in jeopardy of losing his job. That was not so. She sent this after she found herself another job, and she said that Thomas DiBaggio demanded, quote, a dangerous homogeneity of thought. And she also said that, quote, good lawyers no longer speak up for fear of having their reputation tarnished. Damn. Yeah, so this does not sound like a good cultured place. She called his ass out. She did. Thomas DiBaggio did try to spin the story to say that he was actually just withholding the truth about his relationship between, you know, like him and Jonathan to protect Jonathan's family. Yeah, okay. So, sure. There's always some sort of thing they can throw in there to make it. Sound try to not make, so bad. Yeah, try to make it sound not as bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jonathan had been working in his office until almost midnight on December 3rd because he feared he would lose his job. He was working on a plea agreement for the two men that he prosecuted, Dion L. Smith and Walter O. Poindexter. Dion operated a rap music label called Stash House Records. He was also an aspiring rap singer who performed under the name Poppy Jenkins. <gasps> <gasps> yep. <laughs> oh, I kind of love it. You do? I do. Good old Poppy Jenkins. Poppy Jenkins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan had been in court all week prosecuting these two men as they stood accused of dealing heroin from their Hampton neighborhood recording studio on West 36th Street. Well, damn it, Poppy. I know. Dion and Walter were charged with multiple counts of heroin distribution and conspiracy to sell heroin. Walter faced 60 years in prison for three counts of heroin distribution, and Dion was facing 27 years. Dang. And Walter was also accused of killing Alvin L. Jones, whom he believed had burglarized one of their stash houses. Okay. This is going to get really crazy, okay? Okay. 
So the government's main witness, Warren Grace, had testified that he sold and bought heroin with Dion and Walter. Warren had worked with both men, and he was a paid FBI informant. On the stand, Warren Grace and his principal FBI handler admitted that strange things happened while he was working for the Justice Department. Warren Grace was under house arrest, but the FBI agents allowed him to come and go as he pleased. He ended up being accused by some neighbors of shooting up the neighborhood and dealing heroin. So this is our FBI informant here. That's a big accusation. It is. This is not good. So this was while he worked for the feds. Warren distributed heroin, and heroin was also found in his Ford excursion. The defense accused Jonathan Luna of failing to make proper disclosures before the trial about the government's strange dealings with Warren Grace. They also wanted to know what informant Warren Grace was doing with his FBI handlers. Was Jonathan Luna keeping secrets? And if so, why? The judge was <laughs> sorry. Why? Dude. Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I was not ready for that. <laughs> the judge was angry and agreed to do an investigation of Jonathan Luna and his FBI cohorts. That's when he suddenly agreed to a plea deal, which would stop the whole trial. And it would also stop the inquiry of himself and the FBI. Jonathan offered a plea agreement that knocked decades off Dion and Walter's jail time, and it would also mean that Walter would not be charged with the murder of Alvin Jones. But the agreement wasn't actually legal. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah. Jonathan was So, like, did they think it was? Oh, no, no. No, no. No, no. No, no. Um, not legal in the sense of he should not have legally been able to make this agreement happen, but he was going to push it through regardless of that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Jonathan was afraid of some of the FBI agents that were working with him, and some of the agents didn't like him. One or more of the agents had reason to want him discredited or gone. As prosecuting attorney, Jonathan had some input when it came to the handling of his witness, the FBI informant, uh, but he did not have control. The FBI would be the ones in charge of him. The week prior to his death, on November 22, 2003, Jonathan's hometown newspaper, the New York Times, had lined a story that was called, quote, FBI let innocents get death sentences report. A closely watched congressional committee issued a report exposing FBI informant activities in Boston. Oh, no. Oh, mm. boy. Okay. So this is a, there's a lot of corruption happening here. Oh, yeah. So one retired agent was even charged with arranging gangland murder with the help of his longtime informants. And if you haven't heard that term, gangland murder, um, it means organized crime. Oh, okay. One committee Wait, witness. What is it called? Gangland murder. But it's it's organized crime. Correct. It's such a weird name for it. I know. It confuses me. It's <laughs> yeah. Sending me mixed signals. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> One committee witness, a U.S. attorney, testified, "Quote: If you go against the FBI, they will try to get you." They will wage war on you. Okay, well, it's the FBI, yeah. They will cause major administrative problems for me as a prosecutor. It would have precipitated World War II if I tried to get inside the FBI to deal with informants. That was the holy of holies inner sanctum. They wouldn't have allowed me to do anything about that. And I know we're jumping around a little bit here, so... Stop me if anything is getting confusing on the story. Okay, I will. <laughs> so, stop! Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> in the name of I was, love. I was just testing you. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> 
Jonathan's body was found at 5.30 a.m., and it looked like he had left his desk in a hurry. So how would he... Well, yeah, if he left his freaking phone behind and everything else. Yes. And the thing is, is, like, his cell phone and his glasses were right on his desk, like, in the middle. So how would you just leave and not see it? So not, like, a situation where you're, like... Where the fuck is my phone? And you're no, walking in circles for just like an hour. Right there by his laptop. Okay. So everything he would well, need. Probably decently organized too, I suppose, because it's like an office. So you would think so. With his job, yeah. Yeah. He walked out of the office in the federal courthouse shortly before midnight, leaving behind that unfinished plea agreement. The plea agreement wasn't legal. Jonathan was using it to cover up a murder that he was obligated by law to prosecute. Alvin Jones had been murdered by Walter Poindexter, and Jonathan was going to cover it up, and he was under a ton of pressure to get it done. If he didn't find a way to get the plea agreement, he and others in law enforcement would be under investigation in federal court. He was working on a legal file that now becomes evidence in his own investigation. But the people in charge of his investigation are the subjects of the investigation. Oh, my God. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is a vicious circle. It's so bad. This, this is going to run deep here. The author of The Midnight Ride of Jonathan Luna, William Kiesling, began doing his research at the federal courthouse in Baltimore, just a few blocks from Inner Harbor. Jonathan's office was in a neighborhood that had high crime rates, and William Kiesling noticed there was even a sign in the parking garage that provided a warning. Be sure to take your cell phone from your car. Oh, yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. Inside the office, he learned that Jonathan had gone out of his way to meet people in the courthouse where he worked, and they all seemed to like him, and many of them were traumatized by his death. William mentioned that every time he went to the courthouse to review the files that Jonathan last worked on, the receptionist would make a quick call, and the same man would appear. He felt like he was being watched. Like, they were trying to keep track of everybody that touched those files. But why? He was, after all, just an author. Is there something they didn't want people to find? Well, apparently. Either way, it was definitely on William's radar. And I do want to mention here, because I've never really done it this way, I really can't help but go down the conspiracy road, and I'm taking y'all with me. Oh, I'm so stoked. We are heading down a dangerous path on this story. It's probably a slippery slope, but I'm so okay with it. Okay, good. (laughs) Because I do know a lot of people, when I listen to other things, we're trying to stray away from it, and I'm like, I'm sorry. This one you just have to dive into. Here we go. Yeah. (laughs) So as the author was sifting through the documents, it became obvious that files were missing. Things that were referenced in the documents were not in the folder, and the transcripts of the court proceedings, the written record of what had been said in the court that day, wasn't in the folder either. William asked the clerk if he could get a copy of the transcript from Jonathan Luna's last case, and she said, There aren't any court transcripts from that. She said that he could order them, but guess what? The court reporter was retiring, so you better hurry. Of course. (laughs) So he's like, okay, I will hurry. He calls up, and of course, shoot, the court reporter retired. Wow. (laughs) Imagine that. So weird. William was able to get the court reporter's home phone number. So he called Ned Richardson and asked, hey, can you still help with this? Ned said that the records he was looking for were viewed as sensitive. Uh, We're getting places here. By whom? William asked. And Ned said, by the FBI. Mm Mm-hmm. Hmm. They were part of a criminal investigation, and he didn't know if they could actually be released. He had just finished transcribing them for the investigators, and 
Then he turned them over to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Baltimore right before he retired. Williams said, well, court transcripts are public documents. Ned told him, well, there's actually 700 pages of transcripts and it's 83 cents a page. So that's a little over $600. How interesting. William was requesting the documents in May of 2004. Jonathan Luna had died in December of 2003. There was supposed to be hundreds of state and federal investigators placed on a task force searching for clues in his death, yet the transcripts from his last court case were just completed? Hmm. <laughs> That's not sus at all. No. No. Not at all. Nothing there. So <sighs> fishy. Ned claimed that the delay was partly due to his retiring, so that's his fault. And he said that the Justice Department had been pressuring him and calling him, asking to get these done. But I cannot imagine that he's the only person that can make that happen. But hey, right. what do I know? One of Jonathan's former associates, Baltimore Assistant U.S. Attorney John F. Purcell, who goes by Jack, had also ordered a copy of the transcripts. Um, you're throwing up your hands, and I'm guessing it's because of the John and Jack thing, yes. which I know I still don't understand. You God. have the same exact amount of letters. That's not short. I don't get it. And I just don't know why they're switched out for one another. I seriously don't get it. I do not understand. They start with the same letter. They're the same amount of letters. Like, yeah. it just doesn't make sense. Just stick with your freaking name. Yeah. I just don't get it. I don't get it. I know. <laughs> This is one I'll just like, I, I just never will understand this one. No. Right. I love that, like, you just said a bunch of things, though, and you knew that's why I was irritated. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so William did rush over with the payment, and he was able to get a copy of the transcripts. Ned said that he knew Jonathan Luna and, quote, he always wore glasses in court. He needed them to see. Okay, you're pointing out the glasses again. Yes, I am. They must be real significant. It is. Ned said that he himself found it very strange that his glasses and cell phone were left on his desk the night he died. He said that some people in the office believed that he had been struggling, but that's not how Ned saw it. He said that Jonathan was bright and articulate. He said that he was on the ball until that last case, where he uncharacteristically was fumbling and became unglued. Ned said that Jonathan's last performance in court was just plain odd. Okay, well, that usually means there's somebody threatening somewhere. Like maybe some blackmail. Something right, is going right. on that's changing this man's behavior. On the witness stand, FBI Special Agent Stephen Skinner, who worked with Jonathan on the Smith & Poindexter case, said, quote, Looked like he didn't want to be there, which was odd because he spent almost two years on this case. You'd think he'd want to be in court. William used this opportunity to ask Ned why he thought Jonathan would ever agree to that plea deal that wasn't legal. Was it because the judge agreed to investigate his star witness, heroin dealer Warren Grace? And Ned said, that's exactly what it looked like to him. William took the transcripts and began sifting through the evidence that was in front of him. It's a very tangled web, and it all began on the day Jonathan Luna met his FBI-sponsored informant, Warren Grace. Okay. Hmm. He started his career as an FBI informant in April of 2002, shortly after he was caught with heroin and a machine gun in Baltimore. That's a really bad combo. So that's the person that's the informant. <laughs> cool, cool. He was 21 years old, and he was also a repeat offender who had already served nearly five years on the heroin and gun charges. Awesome. Less than 18 months earlier, oh God. he had returned to the street from prison. He never got past the 11th grade. He had oh, been selling. Sad. It is. Yeah. He had been selling cocaine and heroin on the streets since he was 14. Oh, God. It's the worst when they get sucked in that it young is because heartbreaking. it's heartbreaking. All they freaking know. 
mm-hmm. and it's impossible to get out of. And it's just, it's sad. It's sad as fuck. Yeah. And his street name was Pug. Okay. Fuck. Because <laughs> you like it. I do, but I do. It's just such a sad thing, but that is an adorable street name. What the shit? <laughs> I knew you'd like that. I love that. <laughs> When he was 16, he Dude, was... I would go through him if I was, like, into that. I would go through him just because his name is Pug. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. Shut up. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. Yikes. Oh, yeah. All right. Moving on Listen, I'm tired, that. okay? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Deal with it. Uh, when he was 16, he was selling crack on the street, and that's when he first ran into Walter Poindexter, who also goes by Fella and Shorty. Fella? Fella. Like, hey there, Fella. Hey, Fella. Hey, oh, Shorty. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, it just sounded really funny when you said it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. In the transcripts, Warren Grace recalls that, quote, I met him beginning in 94, you know, on the strip, on the street corner. He was walking by, walking a dog, and we exchanged numbers and just went from there. You know, he was just walking down the street with his dog. I was hustling. I was selling drugs. Cocaine. He told me he had a few prices about cocaine. Well, I don't think he was just walking his dog then. You don't? It's not what it's feeling like here. Ah. Walter Poindexter handed his number to Warren Grace. He called him up, and they worked out a deal. Walter Poindexter would give him cocaine to sell, and Warren Grace would pay him later on after he was done. He would keep part of it and pay Walter whatever he was owed. Several months into this, in 1994, Warren Grace was arrested for heroin distribution, and he also had a gun. He was arrested numerous times at this point, but he didn't go to prison until 1995, and he was in for four years and nine months. The only person that visited him while he was locked up was his grandfather, and besides that, the other visitor was Walter Poindexter. Yeah, imagine that. He would tell him that he was showing him loyalty. Or he's grooming him. Yeah, essentially. The two of them also talked on the phone, and occasionally Walter would send him money. He visited him once or twice a month for five years, so he was in it for the long haul. While Warren Grace was locked up, he earned his GED, and he was released on December 9th of 2000, and he went to live with Walter Poindexter. Oh, God. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. And in the house was Walter, his brother, and his mother. And they treated Warren Grace like family, which he never really had. He didn't do much for the first few weeks after being released, but then he jumped right back into selling heroin that was being supplied by his friend, Walter. Yep. He said he would stake claim to a Baltimore street corner, set up a heroin shop, and keep it running. He was selling a lot, and Walter had several suppliers, including rap music producer Dion Smith. Okay. So now you're seeing how they're all coming together here. Yep. They were cutting it down into small little rocks or pebble-sized pieces and putting it into small vials. They marketed it, pushed out a lot of the competition, and gave it a distinct name. 9-11. Oh my god. Uh Uh-huh. As if it couldn't get Any more fucked up. Right. Right. (sighs) Now, it is called 9-11, but it is, I mean, it's also referred to as 911. Yeah. So. Yep. Okay. That's pretty rough. Warren Grace said, quote, It was basically just happenstance, really. The name just came up. That was the name we wanted to use because once they hit it, that's what they was going to need. 
911. Oh that is so fucked up. Mm-hmm. He said they'd have to call an ambulance. It was good shit. So once they hit it, that's what they was going to need. 911. I wow. Yeah, so that's nice. Around January of 2001, someone broke into and burglarized an apartment that Walter Poindexter was using as a drug stash house. Yeah. You got it. And word got back to Walter that the culprit was Alvin Jones. I'm just saying people who are brave enough to go into other people's stash houses just, oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. It just. Big kahunas. The balls that you've got. Yeah. Holy shit. For real. It is terrifying. Mm -hmm. Well, one of Walter Poindexter's girlfriends called up Alvin Jones and she was like, I need to warn you. He's blaming your ass. And Alvin Jones told his father that he was being accused of robbing a house. On January 22nd, 2001, Walter Poindexter murdered Alvin Jones. Okay. So that's where that came from? That's where it happened. Jonathan Luna wrote in the court papers that at least two people had witnessed the murder. Afterwards, Walter Poindexter bragged to Warren Grace about the murder. Federal prosecutor Jonathan Luna made the case that Alvin Jones was murdered in retaliation for the break-in at the drug stash house. He filed several court documents and even threatened Walter Poindexter with the death penalty. It just doesn't seem that difficult to see the motivation here. Walter Poindexter's drugs were stolen and he wanted Alvin Jones to pay for it. Right. It sounds simple, but it's not. But it's not. It's not. It's not. (laughs) This very case has many dark secrets and it threatened to expose the FBI's informants. Okay. The case needed to be buried once things started to fall apart. Yeah. Warren Grace's FBI handlers were under fire, and to stop an investigation of the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office, Walter Poindexter would be given what's referred to as the sweetheart plea deal by prosecutors. It's an interesting name. Sure. By law, the plea deal isn't allowed to be given to anyone who commits a drug-related murder. Oh. How do you get around that? Okay. You make the drug-related murder disappear. Right. It was the only yeah, way. Yeah, this is checking out. Yeah. So this is the only way to protect the FBI. Jonathan Luna would have to pretend that Alvin Jones's murder was not related to drugs, and this was a problem for him. Because he didn't want to do it, and soon he was dead. In April of 2001, a few months after Alvin Jones had been murdered, Baltimore City Police raided Walter Poindexter's home and he was arrested. It wasn't for murder charges, though. Just drug charges. Yeah. He was in for a short time, then he was back on the streets dealing heroin. Every time he got locked up, Warren Grace realized, oh, damn, he made more money when he was just running things by himself. So he started setting up his own shop and finding his own supply. And he was also dealing directly with Dion Smith at Stash House Records. Yeah. You can okay. see how things are going here. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah, I can. It's not good. Recipe for disaster. On April 7th of 2002, the police raided the house of Warren Grace, uh, where he had been staying. And in it, they found a scale, some heroin and packaging materials, and two guns. Warren Grace was indicted on three criminal counts. Possession of the firearm as a felon. Possession with intent to distribute 100 grams or more of heroin. Jesus. And aiding and abetting. And oh my gosh, 100 grams or more. That's what I'm saying. That is... That is so much. So he was facing a max of 40 years in jail and a $250,000 fine, and he was just about to turn 22. Wow. Yeah. That is so freaking sad. So real bad here. 
He applied for a public defender on May 13th, 2002, and he said that he was a self-employed rap artist. He said that he did not have cash on hand, but he made about $1,000 a month. He also said he had a dependent, a nine-year-old daughter, Chantille Grace, and he paid $300 per month in child support. He knew he was in big trouble this time. He had already served five years for drug and gun charges. He had two prior convictions. So he was now being labeled as a career yep. offender, yep. which meant he would most likely get a sentence of 30 years to life, and that 30 years would be without parole. Warren Grace started thinking, how can I get myself out of this? So he started talking to the Baltimore City Police, and he told them, hey, I know about that Alvin Jones murder. Ah. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. He threw his very good friend, Walter Poindexter, right under the bus and told them he murdered Alvin Jones in retaliation for the break-in at the drug stash house. That's honestly what happens, though, when you're involved in shit like that. Yes. I mean, they, they'll, all, they'll turn on you after being loyal as fuck to you for the past 15 years. To get out? Are you kidding yeah. me? To yep. sweeten your deal? Absolutely they will. A drug-related murder could put Walter Poindexter away for life. As the Baltimore police began investigating the murder, the word started spreading on the streets that the snitch was Warren Grace. He was doing anything he could to get himself a good deal, and that even meant giving up some of his suppliers and giving up information on other street dealers. The police sifted through all of the information, and the thing they wanted most was stash house records. Oh. Which I was very surprised by this, too. They wanted to bust rap music producers more than they wanted to solve Alvin Jones's murder. The FBI oh. was looped in. And they created the Safe Streets program, which I'm going to put that in huge quotes because it I was saw, not. I saw the yeah. quotes in the corner of my eye. Quotes happening. are flying because I'm telling you, it was not safe. Baltimore FBI Special Agent Stephen Skinner said, quote, The Safe Streets program was put together by the FBI to address what is actually called Safe Streets. Our goal is to make safe streets to make neighborhoods safe. Wow. Right. Did that give you a really good explanation? Yeah, We're definitely. We're going to make safe streets so that you're safe. Got it. Cool. By doing that, we investigate violent groups, gangs, and we put together investigations against those groups using drug violation laws. We have a task force, which basically means that in addition to FBI agents, we also have local police officers who are detailed and deputized to work with us. And they include Baltimore City police detectives. At one point, we had Baltimore County police detectives. We have had Maryland state police detectives. We have also okay, had but housing authority detectives as well. I don't fucking care about right. other detectives. Who what do the hell you are they doing now? Well, what are they actually <laughs> doing to to do anything? That's why I included this quote because I was like, I'm sorry. What are you doing? You and who is involved? Kept going with it because basically you gave me nothing but bullshit, and then you told me who was involved at some point. I got I don't it. Even, yeah. Was that it? Were we? Oh, at that's the, it. Okay. We that were was the end of that quote. Oh, okay. Yep. So basically nothing. Task force members secretly aided and, and abetted the city's heroin traffic, and they let their informants run wild. Take Warren Grace, for example. He was free to deal heroin while working for the task force. Okay. It was a corrupt system that certainly wasn't serving the public. It was crippling them. Warren Grace was described as a cooperating witness. He provided information and almost acted like an agent of the government. He was involved in cases and would do things to help investigations. He was paid by the FBI, but he wasn't employed by them. It was off the books. That's a dangerous game. Yeah. So, 
that's where we're going to end on this one. And next week, here are a few things that you can look forward to. Warren Grace, so FBI informant Warren Grace, struck a deal with the FBI so that he could be released from prison, and that's how he becomes the informant. He broke every rule of his agreement and even manipulated his ankle monitor. Oh, oh, good. He began secretly recording interactions with Walter Poindexter and Dion Smith. Awesome. He was caught with heroin in his vehicle. And the FBI and their mishandling of informants was at risk of being exposed. Cool, cool. The FBI finally raided Stash House Records. And okay. the Smith and Poindexter trial begins. Oh, shit. Oh, we're already? Okay. There's a lot happening. Okay. So, there you go. All right. So, make sure to... Follow us on any of your podcast apps. Tell us the stories you want to hear. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Leave us a five-star review if you love us. Tell your friends. Tell your cats. Um, Bye. Bye.